Hey guys, so I want to give you a little bit of a testimony of the power of God and the grace of God. Um, you know, because the grace of God gets a bad rap from religious folks. Religious folks who are trusting in themselves and their own righteousness, um, they get really offended at the grace of God. They really don't like um, when, a, when a person preaching the gospel of grace takes away all the glory from them and puts it on the Son of God and the cross. Religious people hate this. The grace of God offends them. They hate it because they're glorying in their flesh and they're glorying in their own merit and they're glorying in their own efforts. And so when you preach um, that all the glory is Christ's and that all um, of salvation is Christ, that he himself is the narrow gate, um, that he did everything that's required for you to be saved. Um, when you point people to Christ and to Christ alone, religious people hate this message. It really, really offends them and angers them. And so they throw out all kinds of slanderous things about the grace of God. They say that uh, the grace of God leads people to live licentiously, that the grace of God leads people to sin, that if you preach too much grace, that people are just gonna feel like they can go out and live licentiously, that um, you're an antinomian if you're preaching the grace of God, yada, 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 the slander, the slander, the slander. It's the same old, same old slander um, that's always thrown at the grace of God. It's the same slanderous message that was thrown at Paul. Um, let us do evil so that good will come of it. Uh, why not let us sin so grace may abound, right? This is the accusation that was thrown at Paul, that that's what he was teaching. And it's the same accusation that's thrown at all of us that teach um, the gospel of grace and not of works. Um, religious people hate this message. They will always hate this message. They have always hated this message. Those who follow the way of Cain will always seek to murder those who follow the way of Abel and offer up the blood. Um, those who are trusting in self and their own efforts and their own work will always hate those who are offering up the blood sacrifice um, for forgiveness of sins and mercy. Those of us who offer up Christ, Christ crucified, um, and give all glory to the Son of God will always be hated by those who follow the way of Cain. It's just the way that it is, guys. But I want to give you a testimony of the true power of God's grace. Um, so that you can know that all of these accusations are just that, slanderous accusations. They're not true. Um, they're not biblical. Recently, I had the <clears throat> opportunity to sit down with a young brother in Christ and do a Bible study. Now, this is a, a young brother in Christ. He's only been a Christian for about a year or so. Um, and I got the opportunity to sit down and, and really minister to him about the grace of God. And as we went through the scriptures and as I showed him what the Bible says about um, the fullness of the gospel message, that Christ really did do everything that's required for you to be saved and that you're sealed and you're secure, um, that it's based on Christ and his work, not yours, based on Christ and his obedience, not yours. It's based on Christ and his merit, not yours. Um, when I had revealed this to him and showed him the scripture that talks about this, um, he really, really received it well. Um, and you could see it just opened up uh, a thirst in him and a hunger in him for the word of God uh, to know more about this. Um, man, he just he just ate and drank it up. And it was just really, really great to see um, kind of those burdens lifted up off of him and those chains fall away as he started to realize the fullness of what his Savior really did for him. And what he told me is that he had spent all this time trying to fight this particular sin struggle that he was struggling with um, by memorizing scriptures and by, you know, preventing him ha himself from having access to certain technology and doing all of these things, trying to fight his sin um, in by his flesh, by his own willpower, by his own strength. Um, and in truth, he said he never really found victory that way. But once he started to understand what we were talking about, the grace of God, um, he started to notice that he wasn't having to fight so hard. He wasn't having to fight the sin so hard, that the sin naturally started to just fall away. And he started to get more freedom from it than he ever got by striving by willpower and by strength and by might. Um, when he really just started to understand the gospel in its fullness, 
it gave him a kind of freedom that he never got before. And this is a message that I have heard and seen so many times um, in ministry since I've been doing this, of people that strived under law for so long to try and conquer their sins by strength and by might. Um, but once they started to understand the fullness of the gospel and the grace of God and the mercy of God and what their savior really did for them um, and began to walk in the spirit accordingly, the burdens, the, the sin, the struggle just kind of melted away. And this is what Paul means when he says that because we're not under the law, sin has no dominion over us. Because the law itself is the power and strength of sin, Paul says. So when you die to the law, sin loses its hold on you. It loses its power um, and it loses its dominion over you. So those of us who are not under the law, sin has no power over us. It has no power to condemn us, but it also lose, loses its hold on us because the law itself is the power and strength of sin. And again, this is not to say that the law is bad. It's not. The law is holy and it's good. But in the life of fallen people, it can only produce bad fruit. Um, it's not that the law itself produces bad fruit, but in us, fallen vessels, it produces uh, death. It produces the bad fruit of death and it increases the trespass. Um, I did not know what it was to covet until the law said, thou shalt not covet. And then suddenly I found all kinds of covetousness. It increases the trespass. It stokes the flesh. It inflames the sinful nature, okay? And so this is why we must die to the law and walk in the spirit if we want to have victory over the desires and the lusts of the flesh, okay? And this comes by God's grace, understanding the fullness of the gospel, understanding the cross and what Christ really did for you. When you're truly set free from the burden and the bondage that you were under, and that includes law as well as sin, um, when you are truly set free from that, that's when the power of the gospel starts to take hold of your life and you start to notice that you get victory over things that you didn't have victory over before, okay? Now, I'm not saying that this, you know, you should expect sinless perfection because Lord knows I haven't achieved it either. Um, but I have noticed that when I'm walking in the spirit, when I'm walking in the truth of Christ and when my eyes are fixed on Christ, when I'm abiding in him and when I'm trusting in him and in him alone, um, my sin loses its power. My sin loses the same draw that in affection that it has as when I'm walking in condemnation and I'm questioning my identity, all right? Because guys, I want you to understand this. This is a very important truth. As long as the enemy can get you to question your identity in Christ, as long as he can get you to question whether you really are a child of God or not, he can rob you of your power he can rob you of your peace. He can rob you of your assurance. And when all of those things are robbed from you, he can rob you of your power to fight sin. Because you will never find the power to fight sin in your willpower or your flesh, because your flesh is weak. Your flesh is incapable of resisting the flesh. It can't resist itself, which is why we needed to be cut away or circumcised from our flesh. We needed to be born again because this flesh is filthy, it's rotten. It's still rotten and filthy until the day it dies and goes back into the dust. And we put on the imperishable body, the glorified body. So the flesh is incapable of controlling itself. So every, every, every method that you use that's based on willpower or fleshly strength, it's going to fail in the end. It's just, it's vain attempts to control the flesh with the flesh. The Bible says, in order to control the flesh, we walk in the spirit. And walking in the spirit is walking in Christ, abiding in Christ, because the Spirit is ever pointing us to the cross and ever pointing us to Christ crucified. And so by walking in the Spirit, we're having our eyes fixed on Christ like Peter when he got out of his boat and he started walking on water as long as he looked at Christ. But the moment he looked away from Christ, he sank. And this is what Christ means, that only those who are abiding in me will produce fruit. The moment we look away from him, and we start trusting in something other than him. We start trusting in us. We start trusting in ourselves. We start trusting in flesh. Expect all power to leave you because the power is not found in this. It's found in him. It's found in him and him crucified. 
And the gospel and the spirit of God will always point you to him, to Christ and Christ crucified, because that's where the power is, guys. Apart from him, you can do nothing, all right? And every time we try to fight sin and we fight and, and we question our identity, am I really a child of God? Am I saved? Am, am, I his, am I really his son or daughter? Every time we do that, we are a feasting ground for the, for the kingdom of darkness. Because if the enemy can get you to have that seed of doubt that you're God's son or daughter, he can remove totally that power that you have because you're no longer looking at Christ and he can use the storm to get you to sink like Peter. And you will lose all power. You will lose all peace. You will all lose all assurance and you will lose all of the fruits of the spirit because the fruits of the spirit are found in him. They're not found in your flesh. And so as long as we're abiding in him, we're looking to him, we're trusting in him and in him alone, that is where the power is. And the enemy is always at work trying to get you to take your eyes off of him, trying to get you to look at self, look at the law, look at Moses, trying to get you to strengthen it out or tough it out. Listen, guys, I have done a lot of self-defense training in my life. I've done a lot, a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, kind of training martial arts my whole life. From when I was a child, once I got into EMS as part of our curriculum that we do. Um, and there's one thing that we're always taught when you're, when you're going into a, uh, a hand to hand or a, a, a self-defense course or an encounter with somebody, an unarmed encounter with somebody, you're always going to come up against somebody at some point, whether you're a male or a female, you're always going to meet somebody who's stronger and bigger than you. So you cannot count in an unarmed situation on your own personal strength because eventually whether you're a male or a female you are going to be matched up with an opponent who's bigger than you and stronger than you so if you're trusting in your own strength to win that encounter you're putting yourself in a dangerous position because eventually you're going to meet somebody who's bigger than you and stronger than you so you need to train in ways in where you are learning to use something other than your own physical strength to bring you victory in that fight. And one of the things that I used to always struggle with, because I've always been a very physically strong person. And so when I was first learning martial arts, my natural instinct was always to resist my opponent like with brute strength. I wanted to outstrength them. And my teachers would always be like, Michael, you're exhausting yourself. You're using way too much energy trying to go strength to strength with them. Yes, you might be stronger than them, but you don't have to go that route. You're exhausting yourself. You're expending way too much energy. There's an easier way. And he would, use, he would teach me things to use the other opponent's weight and strength against them. So rather than using brute force, I'm using physics. I'm using their own weight and their own body strength against them. It's a lot less taxing on me which means I have more stamina and I can stay in the fight longer because I'm not using my own strength. And instead, I'm diverting force and I'm using methods and techniques that prevent me from having to go strength to strength. And that's the same concept here, guys, when we're talking about our walk as a Christian. If you are trusting in your own strength and willpower to win your fight against sin, you're playing a loser's game because you will, never, you will never have victory over your sin that way. God says to Zerubbabel, not by strength, not by might, but by my spirit. Now, many religious people will say this, but in practice, they're still leading people towards the flesh. Oh yeah, yeah, it's all by the power of the spirit, but what are they going out and doing? They're going about all these fleshly ways to fight their, their sin, and they're teaching all of their congregates to do the same. They're saying with their lips that they're giving glory to God, but they're really not. And they're not teaching their parishioners to give glory to God. They're telling you with their lips one thing and then they're doing another. You're not going to get victory that way, guys. The religious way is not the way. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not the way. You got to eat from the tree of life. He has the power. Him, Jesus Christ, has the power. His spirit in you has the power. That's what you should be looking to. That's what you should be trusting in. And the way you do that is by resting in his grace, by 
trusting in the gospel, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, abiding in him and his work, his obedience, his righteousness, trusting in him. And when you do that, watch the sin fall off in your life. Guys, on this channel, I do not teach to go out and live in wickedness. I don't live my own life that way. I don't want to live in wickedness, and I don't want any of you living in wickedness. I want you guys to turn from those things. But the way that the Bible tells us to turn from those things is to remember our identity. Every passage that you'll find where the apostles are admonishing the church for sin, how do they do that? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom? but that you are not the unrighteous. You are a child of God. You have been washed. You have been justified. You have been sanctified. Don't you know that you're not a child of darkness? That you're not a child of disobedience? That you are a child of light? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know that Christ lives in you? So walk as a child of the light. Walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Every single passage that admonishes believers to walk in newness of life, it does so by telling you to look to Christ. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know that you were crucified with him? Don't you know that you died on that cross with him? Don't you know that you're a new creature? Don't you know that you are risen to new life with him? Don't you know that his spirit lives in you? Don't you know that you are complete and whole in him? Don't you know who you are? And that's where the power is. That's why they're pointing you there. The enemy, on the other hand, and his ministers, on the other hand, are pointing you to you. They're trying to get you to take your eyes off of Christ. They want you to doubt your salvation. They want you to doubt your identity. You say you're a child of God. Really? I don't think you are a child of God because if you really were a child of God, you would be doing this, this, and this. If you really were saved, would you be struggling with this? Would you be struggling with that? A really, truly saved person does this and looks like this. They want to get you to doubt. They want to get you to trust in something other than Jesus. The power to overcome sin in your life comes from looking to Jesus and to him alone. The power is in him this is why Christianity starts with Christ. It's christ Christianity. It's not Michael-anity. It's not Lisa-anity. It's Christianity. Christianity is a person, and it's found in that person. He is the narrow gate. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. All the power, all the completeness is found in him. So if you are lacking power, you look to him. You trust in him. Look to him. The enemy is always at work, just like with Job's friends, trying to get Job to doubt that God declared him righteous. God declared Job righteous. And what was the enemy through his minions doing? Oh, Job, you must have done something to offend God. God is righteous. He is holy. If you're coming under judgment, you've done something to offend him. And that's what the enemy's always doing to you. Through these pastors, through these ministers of righteousness. If you're listening to a pastor who day in and day out is hell-bent, no pun intended, I'm trying to get you to question your identity in Christ. That's not helping you guys. That's leading you down the wrong path. Because if the enemy can get you to doubt your identity in Christ, can get you to doubt whether you're a child of God, he's going to have a field day with you. But you know the person that he runs from? You know the person that he flees from? The person that says, no, God has said that I'm his son. God has said Yes, indeed, he did say that I am righteous, that in him, in Christ, I am the righteousness of God. Get behind me, Satan. That's the person that he fears. But the one who is weak, 
the one who is doubting, the one who is not assured, the one who is being told that he's not really a child of God, that person is going to be weak to the accusation of the enemy. Guys, your faith and your assurance is in a person, and that person is not you. All glory goes to the Son of God, with whom God is well pleased. I hope that this makes sense. Guys, I want all of you to have victory over your sin. I pray that I have victory over my sin and my struggles. But the way to do that is not by striving in your flesh under the law. The power to do that is found in the cross and Christ crucified. Walking in that truth is walking in the spirit. And that's how you will have victory over the flesh. I love you guys.